All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting on today's call. We'll, uh, we'll start off with Acts 21. So let's just pray and uh, begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, uh, your grace, Father God, and uh, Lord, for enabling us, uh, Lord, to study uh, the life of the early church and uh, the journeys of uh, Apostle Paul, O oh God. And Father God, even as we see the interactions between the believers and, uh, Lord, the, uh, the leading uh, about this of the Holy Spirit in their lives, Lord, help us, Father God, to learn from it and apply it in our own lives uh, and father help us lord to also uh, lord be those who see the kingdom work expand oh father thank you lord thank you once again for this time in jesus name we pray amen so we'll quickly recap uh, acts 19 and 20. Um, now let me show the map to us so that we can look at the places and talk So you can look at the map here. Uh, the third missionary journey of Apostle Paul from AD 53 to AD 57. We see it starting in Antioch and then him moving through the region of Galatia. And from there, he spends most of his time in Ephesus, three years in Ephesus, though it's a four year journey nearly you know like three-fourths of his time is spent in ephesus that's where he builds up a lot of believers and uh, disciples and from there he continues on to various places we saw in the uh, last class how he went from ephesus and he goes on to the macedonian region and these are all known places where he had already been earlier uh, during the second missionary journey. So he spends time there. He also uh, writes to the Corinthians. Yeah, we, we saw that. So he writes to the Corinthians. He makes his second visit to Corinth. And uh, again, on the way back, like he comes up to Philippi and from Philippi moves on to a place called Troas. And in Troas, we saw how he had the opportunity to preach to the believers who were so eager to hear God's word. They did not even, they, they did not mind giving up their sleep. Uh, and they stayed on listening to Paul as he preached the entire night. Uh, and in that situation, there was a disciple by the name of Eutychus who fell asleep and fell from the third floor and he, third floor and he died. Uh, and even then, God's power was evident. Paul was able to go raise him up and uh, he goes back into his teaching. So this way he ministered at Troas and he continues. We saw that he stops at uh, some of the port cities, Assos, uh, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, and from there he comes to this place called as Miletus. So Miletus, what what is the uh, important discussion or the uh, important meeting that takes place there? We we studied it in the last class, Acts chapter twenty. Something very very crucial. So you can look up the note, look up the uh, chapter if you wish to. Very good. Yes. So Paul calls for all the elders of uh, the church of Ephesus. And we saw how he had already appointed elders. So that's a common practice for the growth of the church. So it's like uh, if you look at the uh, stages of church growth, there are different things. Spending time with the people, teaching them, establishing them in the doctrine. Uh, but at the same time, having trusted leaders who will oversee the church. So just think about this. Three years he was in Ephesus. 
and now there are elders uh, it does not really mention the number of people so our guess is like when it said elders there could be many people who are elders in the church of ephesus so it was actually doing very well uh, and uh, so he calls them and what does he talk to them about some of the themes that he covers uh huh some highlights from his uh, speech yes, regarding how others are about Correct. He, yes. So he warns them about people who may come up with wrong teaching, who may harm the church, and he uh, lets the people know that the elders know that they have to protect the church. Like the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. So that's a special thing. Now we didn't dwell much on that scripture, but uh, let's quickly look at maybe two scriptures which are really important in Acts. I mean, every scripture is important, but uh, something that gives us additional insights. So Acts uh, twenty. Twenty-eight, right? Uh, yes, correct. So, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. Okay, so it is really powerful. He is asking the leaders to be serious about their responsibility. Take heed, uh, or or. Uh, you know, commit yourself, be sincere, uh, or give attention to the responsibility that has been given. Now, who gives the responsibility to be overseers? Who assigns it? Who gives the responsibility to people to be leaders over the church? Yeah, so notice responsibility or, or uh, uh, positions of leadership positions of, uh, um, you could say, uh, authority in the church. It's not that it's only given by people. Yes, God uses people. God, uh, you know, works through people. But ultimately, we must remember that this responsibility is coming from God. And Holy Spirit is the third person of God, right? Third person in the Trinity. So... The responsibility that they had as elders, who are all these people? Elders. So the responsibility is from God himself. So that makes us even more like we take our work seriously. Because it's not we. It's not we who, who uh, you know, chose and then uh, now we are overseers. It doesn't work like that. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who puts people as overseers. Uh, notice uh, some more things in that uh, uh, scripture. He says to shepherd the church. Shepherd the church. Shepherd the church means like a shepherd takes care of the sheep. So what are all the activities uh, in, in shepherding? Feeding the sheep, uh, ten, like tending the flock, protecting the flock, um, then, you know, what else can you say? Just spending time with the flock. So there are many things that come under shepherding. Now, if the Holy Spirit has made these people as the elders to shepherd the church, that means they carry all these responsibilities. Uh, and similarly, you know, if, if any one of us, we are uh, called by God, places of responsibility to take care of God's people, we must take it seriously. And look at the last portion of that scripture. It says, the church of God. Whose church is this? Church? Church is God's church. No, church is not, as we study in House of God, uh, church is not, you know, my church, your church, uh, belonging to uh, us, you know. So, even to say my church, with, with a, like for a pastor or a leader to say, okay, I have established this is my church. 
it won't be accurate because ultimately the church is God's church. It's his church where he is appointing us to work for him. So the church of God, it says church of God and it says which he purchased. So it's been ransomed. It's been redeemed. It's been bought back. Bought back from what? We know the earth was corrupted, right? But Jesus came, he paid the price. Once he paid the price, he bought our redemption. So it is purchased with his own blood. Now, this also helps us understand how we must value the church. The church was bought back, redeemed by the Son of God himself. And it's not free. You know, sometimes when we get uh, products that are free, we don't value it. We think, yeah, we got it. Somebody paid for it and we got it. But in this case, think about it. The church is of the Lord Jesus and he paid with his blood. So is it, is it, um, it's definitely, it's free for us. But was it free for God to make this happen? No, he paid a huge price with his own life, with his own blood to purchase the church. And so when we are overseers or we are given responsibility over the church, it's it's really, uh, you know, some something of reverence uh, where we must have the fear of God. If someone, let's say, you know, hands us a, a MacBook, Okay, with the latest features, very, very expensive, something, you know, very uh, expensive and all that. They say, okay, you keep it, okay, and uh, uh, make use of it and get all the work done, don't damage it, and they go, right? Wouldn't we take a lot of care of that uh, instrument or tool because it's so expensive? How would we treat it? We won't just you know, leave it on the table and go away. I'm sure we'll find a place to keep it or a bag to keep it because it's valuable. Somebody paid for it. Somebody paid a huge price to get it. And so similarly, when we consider the church of the Lord Jesus, uh, it's not free as such. There's been a huge price that has been paid for the church uh, that God paid with his own son and his blood. And so in our sight, whenever we have uh, any responsibility, God gives us any responsibility in the kingdom. Okay, do this, teach or um, uh, take care of the people, any responsibility. We do it with very high regard because something valuable has been given to us. So that's how we must consider it. Okay, so just two verses only I'm highlighting. Uh, but we can actually sit on Acts 20 and uh, the the talk of the encouragement of Paul. We can we can do that for I don't know how many classes. In the past, it has happened. We've discussed one verse after the other, and it's rich with insight. Now let's look at verse 32. Uh, Acts 20, verse 32. This is turning out to be a very long recap, <laughs> but uh, it's helpful. So Acts 20 verse 32, here again, uh, we, we see Paul says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. So again, look at this. He says, the word of God, which is able to build you up. So there is an emphasis on the ministry of God's word in the church. Without the word being spoken, without the word being taught to the people, uh, do you think they'll be able to grow up in God? No. So how will the people be discipled? How much time did Paul spend in Ephesus? How much time did he spend in Ephesus? Three years. And how much time did he spend um, teaching in the school of Tyrannus? Yeah. Okay, two years. So can you imagine how much, how much Paul would have taught the people? 
two years, two long years, okay, day in and day out. So this also helps us know the kind of um, input that has gone into the believers and how it's built them up that now there are some of them who are elders. Okay. Uh, and once again, he's saying, I'm committing you to God's word. God's word has a capacity to build you up. So if we want to be built up, we must give ourselves to the word of God. We'll also quickly look at one more, uh, one more important scripture. Uh, verse 27. He says, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Okay. Have you thought about this? The whole counsel of God. What does it mean? Everything. Yeah. So whole counsel of God means well-rounded. Now, now let's take, for example... The subject of grace. Grace means that we have received something that we don't deserve. God's goodness has been given to us uh, because of Jesus, not because of our own righteousness. And we receive blessings through God's grace. Okay. And we keep moving forward. Now, if we only talk about grace and we don't talk about you know, uh, doing the right thing, walking in righteousness. Uh, would it be, would it be skewed, or would would uh, like be uh, the balance would be gone, right? So when Paul says, "I taught you the whole counsel," it means that he has covered every necessary topic and given us. You know, as much as possible by him, as much as the revelations given to Paul, he's presented all the truths, right? So that it's well-rounded. It's not like he only taught on one subject and left out another subject. So while we talk about, in this example, talk about grace, we also talk about truth. Because in Jesus are found both grace and truth. So in that way, uh, he did not leave the em emphasis on a few subjects and leave the believers uh, unprepared. So well-rounded preparation, well-balanced preparation, and he taught the whole counsel of God's word. So this is a challenge to us as you know, pastors, leaders, uh, teachers of God's word. When we teach, are we able to prepare the believer in every aspect, you know, the spiritual aspect uh, and maybe even, you know, the practical aspects of life. So in this way, the believer is thoroughly equipped to do the work of God. So these are the tall claims of Apostle Paul. The ministry that he did was done with excellence. He's boldly saying, I've taught you the whole counsel of God's word. And now I'm committing you to the word of God. Okay, you do your work the way he did his work. You remember, he also said things like, I served with humility. I did not covet your silver or gold. So I served sincerely. So all these things he spoke, he warned the church uh, uh, and uh, asked the leaders to be alert. And towards the end of of his uh, encouragement. You remember how um, he talked about him going away and that he's not going to come back. Yeah. So uh, he told them that um, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me that chains await me, that I'm going to face difficulties and I may actually not come back. So what was the impact of this on the elders? Yes, yes, yes. So they uh, like a like a you know a, br a brotherhood where people love each other. They they cried when they heard 
what Paul said, and uh, you know, they they hugged each other, expressed their affection, and so it was a it was a really blessed fellowship that they had with each other. And in this way, they uh, bless him and they send him off in the rest of the journey. So that is a long recap of uh, Acts 20. And we are at Miletus. So now we uh, will continue to read about the journey of uh, Paul. So he will stop by at uh, a few more places. And uh, following that, he will go to Jerusalem. So let me make this map clearer. Yeah, so we are at Miletus. So now he is journeying. I'm not reading the names of the places that, you know, uh, he, he's not going to stay much there. And Luke doesn't write much about those places. But he'll come to this place called as Tyre. And here we'll, we'll talk about what um, Paul does. And from there, we will read a little bit more about Paul in this place called Caesarea. Okay, and then finally, he'll go on to Jerusalem. So why is he going to Jerusalem? Mm, one of the primary reasons is he wants to go and deliver the aid which was received. You remember, he sent some brothers to collect money. Yeah. So he sent some uh, reliable people to collect money so that aid may be given over to Jerusalem. So that is his primary reason why he wants to go to Jerusalem. Okay. So we are clear. AD 53 to AD 57, this is the route of Paul's missionary journey and places where he stops and uh, uh, interacts with the believers. Now, let's move on to Acts 21 and see what's happening. So now that uh, Mithlin is done, which is the next place that we saw on the map? The next important place, Acts 21. Please go ahead. You can uh, read, read it silently and uh, let me know which is the next prominent place. Where does he stay? And landed at Tyre. Okay, so he comes to this place called as Tyre. Do you remember it on the map? It's it's uh, north north of Jerusalem. Okay, so he comes to this place called as Tyre, and over here uh, was four. Again. Interesting. It says, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. Do we realize that since the time of, um, you know, the birth of the early church, there are disciples in many different places. Okay, and that too, it's it's that region. Uh, uh, close to Jerusalem. So there are already disciples. We did not specifically read that, you know, Paul had gone there earlier and he had done ministry and all. We don't read about that. So it, it's likely that it wasn't him. Uh, but there were others, others who have done ministry over there. So disciples are there. So this also is a joyful news because the word of God is spreading. And many, many people are uh, trusting God. Uh, isn't this amazing? Like maybe when we are traveling and then we bump into somebody uh, who speaks a different language, they are from a different state or a country, and then we find out that they also are, are a believer. We feel so excited, right? Like, oh, really? Like you, even you know about Jesus? That's so wonderful. So somewhat like that, he meets disciples. and. Paul, he's always interested to equip the disciples. So he stayed there 
seven days, spend time with them. And these disciples told Paul through the Holy Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So, uh, was there a was there a, a a prompting in Paul's spirit also not to go to Jerusalem? Yes. Correct. So when he was speaking to the elders in Acts chapter 20, he said at that time also that I'm sensing this, that if I go to Jerusalem, there are troubles avail awaiting me. Now, this is the second time when God speaks to us, do you notice that he's speaking in many different ways, but he's saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit is telling him, through the disciples of Tyre that uh, do not go up to Jerusalem. But what happens? He still goes. He's still moving in that direction. So he they spent time there. And after that, they departed, it says, and they went on their way. Uh, and uh, when Paul and team wanted to go, uh, these Disciples of Tyre, they accompanied them with their wives and children till they were out of the city. And then uh, they knelt down on the shore and prayed. So why am I reading this? Just to show us that, uh, you know, everywhere the brethren met, there was this, this connectedness that happened almost immediately. Though they were not, they don't seem to be... Uh, known to Paul from the beginning, they are still like a family member. They're going and you know how we say bye. So they go and they, they uh, uh, bid a farewell to Paul and the team. It says with the wives, the children, they knelt on the shore, they prayed. So once again, it's warm fellowship wherever they go. Uh, you know, the, the, the kingdom of God, the, the family of God everywhere is there. Um, uh, interacting with with Paul, and um, he's sharing the love of this family. So now from there they continue, and they come to the next uh, prominent place. Of course, they they stop by at uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce uh, the word Ptolemais, I think. But uh, after which they go to this place known as Caesarea. So now Caesarea uh, is the place where Philip the evangelist lives. Do we know Philip? Have we heard of Philip anywhere else? Where did we where did we meet Philip earlier? First, he was one of the people appointed uh, in the distribution of food for the widows. Mm. Uh, okay, not Philip. Are you able to hear me? Okay, so we're all thinking. How about the online students? Do we remember Philip from any place earlier? Yes, Nina? Yeah, now he's in Caesarea. Oh, no, Samaria. Okay, uh, Nina, you're saying something, but unfortunately, I'm not able to hear you. Uh, okay, very good. But, but Nina has also posted on the chat here, she says, he preached in Samaria. Do you all remember? Simon the sorcerer. And there was great joy in the city. Okay. And Philip is also, he's also one of the six uh, volunteers. So how many volunteers were there? Acts chapter 6. You can just quickly go back and read out their names. Seven, right? Yeah, seven. Seven were chosen. So can we quickly read their names? Uh, 
Acts chapter 6. Okay, uh, Nina, uh, please excuse us. There is some technical difficulty. I know you're... Uh, Mike, please, Nikhil. Uh, one is Stephen, which, uh, which was knowing a man full of faith. And then next, Philippi. And then Protrus, Nico... Nicanor, yes, and Timon, and uh, Parmenas, and Nichols. Yeah. Okay. Now, the reason why I asked us to read the name is when we are reading the name of Philip in Acts chapter six. Okay. Uh, it was the first eight years, isn't it? The first eight years of the growth, birth and growth of the early church. There his name is read as Philip. Now let's read his name in Acts 21. How does it introduce Philip to us? Yes. Okay. So now his name is introduced, he is introduced as the evangelist. Why, why wasn't he called as the evangelist earlier? Because he already had the call of the evangelist. Because it was the same Philip who went to Samaria, who preached the gospel, many believed. And then if we remember, he went, you know, to, um, uh, uh, like he met the Ethiopian eunuch. He ministered the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, baptized so, so much of evangelistic work was done by him. And yet, there it only states Philip. Here it states Philip the evangelist. So, how do we understand this? Okay. The calling, right? The calling which uh, Philip had. Well... Uh, excuse me, the way God works with us is he gives us a calling and we may, we may already know our calling. So even when we talk about Apostle Paul, he would have known, isn't it? So through his years of waiting, he, he got that understanding of who he should be. But God lets us get prepared and become more mature. So same thing is happening in the case of Philip as well. He was a volunteer in the church. Uh, this was, you know, around AD 30, 33, 35. And now we are AD 53. So from 33 to 53, about, about uh, you know, uh, sorry, we are right now end of the third missionary journey. So AD 57, right? Around there. So 20 plus years since the time that he started volunteering in church and doing his evangelistic work. Only then the Bible describes him as an evangelist. So, you see, God is not in a hurry to uh, let us, uh, what can I say, as I stated earlier, preparedness and maturity. So God gives us that time to grow even in our calling and only after that comes the recognition. So it's, it's a lesson for us that uh, we should let God work in us and through us and not worry too much about our titles. Now, if the calling is there and if, uh, you know, we, we gain honor in the sight of God, gain honor in the sight of people, eventually, People will call us whatever our calling is, but we don't really have to push for it or we don't really have to uh, uh, like promote ourselves. Like even for Philip, I'm sure he would have known that I am an evangelist and uh, God is working powerfully through me. Then why are people not calling me evangelist? But we don't see him 
going after the name. He just did the work, you know. So in our lives, we have that season when we just have to work. Just do the work. Whether anyone recognizes it or not, just do the work. Now, if the if God has called us, we can't hide the calling. It will show. Okay. So this is the way we understand it. Now let's look at one more detail here in the life of Philip. So it says in verse 9 that this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So what does this tell us? It tells us as God spoke in Acts chapter 2. And in those days I will pour out my spirit right on all flesh. Uh, you know, and sons and daughters will prophesy. Think about this. Here's a man. He has children and he has daughters. But seems like he was a godly father who built a godly home that his daughters were filled with the Holy Spirit. All, you know, all his four daughters, they prophesied. Okay. And they're likely to be young. It says virgin daughters, they prophesied. So they're not yet married. Uh, and yet he, he nurtured them in the ways of the Lord. So that also is a beautiful testimony. One thing is to be faithful to the church and faithful to the ministry. But another thing is to also be mindful of the home and the family. So Philip uh, seems to have that testimony that not only was he doing God's work, but he was also uh, raising up his family in a godly way. And that's a wonderful uh, wonderful thing. One more thing, let us notice here. It says, daughters who prophesied. Now, there are uh, there, there are some, uh, there is a little bit of hesitation when it comes to uh, the prophecy from women, right? But you see this passage here, there were four women, all of them are prophesying and it's quite clear. So it's possible that women can prophesy okay prophesy is what prophesy is to speak the inspired word of god so women were speaking the inspired word of god even in those olden days uh, and so today we must not stop women from prophesying okay now let's let's read on um, and he stayed there for some more time and a certain prophet by the name of Agabus came down from Judea. So now we have the entry of another man of God or a prophet uh, who will share the same information that God has been speaking to Paul earlier. Uh, but again, notice, you see, God speaks through whom he wants to uh you know if i might use the word safely use so god is choosing to use agabus to speak to paul why not philip's daughters they were also prophesying but the word did not come through the daughters it came through the prophet agabus so god's word will come from anywhere that god chooses the word came back to Paul stating that he must not go to Jerusalem. So we'll talk more about this right in the next class. But I, I'm hoping that we got some good insights in today's class. Um, so for the next class, it will be a recording. Is that OK or should we? Because generally when I do a recording, the content comes like uh, uh, I'll just kind of state everything. But in case you all want to ask any questions and all, uh, that may not be possible. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll I'll uh, do the class as much as I can. Maybe complete Acts chapter 21 and get into Acts 22. But you can all go through it. And the next class, we'll start with questions. I think that way we can uh, uh, clarify your doubts and continue. OK, fine. So uh, for today, let's just uh, pray and close. Nikhil, can you please read?
Father, we thank you for this wonderful time, Lord. Once again, we come to your presence, what you have studied, Lord. Thank you for teaching us through ma'am, Lord Jesus, and give us more deep meaning from your word, Lord Jesus, so we can understand easily, Lord. Thank you. Give us knowledge. Give us spirit to understand, Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And thank you. All the best, everyone, for your assignment. God bless.